I, um, I've had a cold all week, and it seems to be hanging on. So if I have to turn and cough, I take a drink of water. I apologize up front. So uh, before I open up in prayer, I want to tell you about a missionary uh, that went to New Guinea. And he was there for about a year. And it came time for him to leave. So the tribal leader sits down with him, and he says, oh, he goes, thank you so much for coming. He goes, I appreciate you taking time away from your family, coming to New Guinea and, and teaching us the word of God, opening up church and doing baptisms. So the missionary, uh, he goes, uh, oh, no problem. He said, I really enjoyed uh, learning your culture. He said, and uh, your food is amazing, you know. So the, the tribal leader says to him, he goes, uh, do you have any questions? And the missionary goes, no, I don't. Well, you know, he goes, I do have one. And uh, the tribal leader says, well, what is it? He said, every once in a while, he said, I'd see a three-legged pig walking around. And, uh, and the tribal leader goes, oh, that's a good pig. That pig, he come in our hut in the middle of the night, our hut was on fire, and he woke us all up. He got us out and he saved our life. That's a good pig. And the missionary goes, wow, that is a good pig. He goes, that pig, he goes, my daughter, she swam out too far. That pig, he go out and take his snout. And he knows they're all the way back to shore. Save my daughter's life. He goes, that's a good pig. So the missionary goes, yeah, that is a good pig. He goes, well, how come he only has three legs? Bible leader says, good pig like that? You don't eat him all at once. Uh, let me open up in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone that came out. I pray that you would prick hearts, touch lives, um, touch my voice. And uh, we just thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first four years of my life were pretty uneventful. Um, fifth year, things started to heat up a little bit. So me, my cousin, and a friend were uh, coming home from school. So we got uh, near our house, and we could see my grandfather up on the farm burning brush. So we said, hey, let's change out of our school clothes and go up and help him. So we did that, we met back there, and my grandfather was a kind man, loved kids. And so he kept us back, he was very safe. So we, as five-year-olds, would bring over branches and sticks and leaves and whatever we could, you know, kind of playing, really. So the brush, the brush pile burned down, um, and it was just cold. So my grandfather went on to another brush pile. So us three boys were just sitting there talking and taking leaves and, and watching them melt. So we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, one of them flipped up and went down in my right-hand pocket. Well, instantly, I, I was on fire. Well, I was born right-handed, so of course, I hit with my right hand. My cousin and my friend, of course, they got scared, so they kind of went and hid behind a tree. And so my grandmother was on the phone, and something says, check on your husband, you know. So she goes to the porch, and she looks out. She didn't see Dom. My grandfather, she saw me in flames. So she put down the phone, run out. So my grandfather and my grandmother got there at the same time. And they rolled me around and ripped my clothes, put the fire out. But by the time they got done, I noticed that my right hand was severely just in a lot of pain. My upper body was, had like pain that was kind of going straight through me. It wasn't like an uh, outside pain. It was like, almost like a soul pain. It was um, kind of like I couldn't even talk or cry because it, it was so much pain. So my grandparents walked me down and walked through the garage and um, opened the door, and my mom's cooking. So she screams, and she heads down the hallway. So I'm standing there, you know, and um, the fire had heated up the blood in my right hand, and it started splitting the skin. So blood's going all over the floor. So mom, she comes up, got one sheet. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to need that for this. <laughs> so she, she wraps my hand up, and she goes back to get another sheet. So in the meantime, somebody from um, the uh, neighborhood calls my dad. Uh, hey, Roland? He goes, uh, he's been burned. Click. So dad, you know, back then you get prank calls and stuff like that. It's like, I had a prank call? Who wants to believe that, right? So dad gets in the car, boom, he's in the door yet. So dad comes in, grabs me, we all hop in the car. I didn't hop, dad probably threw me in the back seat. 
And so we went up to the hospital, and they said, ship him to Shriners Burns immediately. And um, the hospital had just been open for like four or five years. So they put me and mom um, in an ambulance, bagged me in ice, which felt good, and took us to Waterville, and then flew us into Boston. Let me take it. So I landed in Boston, and they took me right in and started uh, debreeding me, started taking dead skin off, and trying to find what was good. And so, um, so of course, I get in there, and they, I think I heard one of the doctors say, let's give this kid full body pain experience, because they said, we need skin. So they took skin off both my legs and to cover up flesh wounds. So I woke up in a cubicle, and I had bloody bandages upper body, bloody bandages lower body. My hands, they had put pins through my fingers, bolts through my wrist, and my hands were in cages. And on those cages were cables. Those cables went up over a pulley system. And behind the bed, they had weights. They'd put on weights. And they would haul you up so it would keep you from healing constricted. But the problem with that is, has anybody ever had a burn and you take the skin and you pull on it a little bit? Well, my whole upper body was being stretched. Plus, I had the bolts of my wrists and the pins of my fingers, which were being pulled. And after a while, your joints and your shoulders, you know, just get sore. So I kept working my way down and pulling the system, pulling the pulleys down, pulling the pulleys down. I got to a point where I go, <sighs> then nurse would walk by and she'd go, oh no, honey, you can't do that. She'd come in and you hear a clunk, clunk, and back up I went. Now the good thing about that is, is I started a lifting program at the age of five. Maybe you've heard of it, it's called Feel the Burn. You heard that? You don't think I got a body like this eating donuts, do you? <laughs> Uh, nighttime, uh, nighttime at Shriners was a war zone. Kids crying, screaming, hollering all night long. You didn't sleep. Some was crying, they missed the parents. Some were crying in pain, some both. Um, some were hollering for more meds. Some, uh, uh, the nurses were going around and did every hour, but the curtains were cloth. It was not like you had your own room that was insulated. So they could be at the last patient, eight beds over. It meant they click the light on, start talking, you're awake. So you didn't sleep at night at all. So morning came, and then they'd bring you breakfast, and then you would meet your nurse, and you'd be a nurse you liked, or a nurse you're like, oh, no. And so you'd eat breakfast, and then they would come and do uh, bandage changes. Uh, they'd come in, and depending on how many bandages you had, depending on how long it took. Well, I had a, quite a few at the first, first time I was there. So they, uh, the nurse would come in. It took around an hour, sometimes two hours, to do bandages. So what they would do is when they unwrap the bandages and they got down to the open skin, the cold air would hit, and it would send your body into a shake. And so for the whole time they changed your bandages, you'd shake. So my hands are in cages, so all you'd hear is just, Sound like an old Model T that didn't have any oil in it, you know? <laughs> and so um, finally they got done changing the bandages, and then they would bring you in a nice warm towel, put a warm towel on you. And within five minutes, your body would just collapse of exhaustion. And so then I fell asleep. I sleep two or three hours and um, wake up, have lunch, supper, and do the whole thing over again for probably the first month or two until things started to heal up a little bit. Excuse me again. So I remember um, them wheeling me out to the playroom, and they wheeled my bed next to a window. And so I'm looking out, and I could see um, the skyline. I could see a lot of buildings in Boston. And so I'm looking, and I remember specifically seeing God. Why me? That's a bad question. I said, God, out of all the people in the world, why me? 
And then, and then I got specific. And I said, Lord, there were three of us here that day. Why me? And I remember at the end of my conversation, I remember feeling at peace because I never, ever asked that question again. I've never to this day have said, poor me, why me? And so I remember um, after my three-month stint, the first time I was in there, um, I got to go home. And I hadn't seen my brothers, my family. Mom was down there. Um, once in a while, and so most of my family, I hadn't seen them in three months. So I went home, and we had neighbors, and we had nosy neighbors, and we had people just kind of waiting to see, you know, where's the elephant man? You know? <laughs> you know? And uh, so I, uh, I remember coming home, and, and we had Christmas, a late Christmas. I remember my brothers, the only time in my life where my brother's willing to wait on me. <laughs> what can we do for you? Oh, you can go down the store and get me a pizza. <laughs> And you can go to the other store and get me chocolate milk. <laughs> and so uh, I remember family coming in, and, and it was really nice seeing family and being home. It, it, it's, it's so comforting. So they sent me home with like a, um, a splint that held my arm out. They were still working on my hand. And, and so at nighttime, they, they sent me home and to put um, this stretch material knit top on to, to compress scars. And it was very small, and it took me and mom probably half an hour with, like, pushing off the wall, pushing off the bedpost, trying to get this thing on. I mean, literally, this thing was so small. If you put it on a walrus, he could pass as a penguin any day of the week, literally. I remember um, my second surgery. I went in, and uh, during my fire, during the fire, my lip had melted down my chin, halfway down my chin. And you could take a Q-tip, and you could go from this side and pretty much pull it out the other side. So second surgery, I go in, and uh, Dr. Remen Snyder comes up, and he puts his thumb on my chin, and he goes, we're going to fix you up, Tiger. I says, all right, good. He goes, we're going to need some more skin. I go, that's not so good. <laughs> and uh, he goes, that's all right, bud. He goes, we're going to take it from your left butt cheek. I went, oh, so I won't be able to sit down. He goes, not for a couple of weeks on that side. I went, got to do what you got to do. So went in, had surgery, and uh, he did a really good job. I, I did have a setback, you know. Um, like if I sit for a long period of time like you're doing, my, my chin goes numb. Yeah. Um, then there was that one time that uh, I'm in church, and my wife reaches over, and she pulls a hair off my chin. I went, ow, what'd you do that for? He goes, oh, honey, with a smirk on her face, you had a hair across your butt. And so, you know us men, we want to uh, one-up them. So I leaned over, I go, oh, honey, you know, that really hurt. Would you kiss my butt right here? So I sit up thinking, you know, I had the last word. And I was not here, butthead. I went, touche, touche, that applies. <laughs> It was my, excuse me, it was my um, fourth, and f fourth and fifth surgery that kind of lightened up my own afflictions. Um, on my fourth surgery, I remember um, it was the day after I'd been operated on, and I had been, um, it was in the morning. I was watching cartoons, um, and also I see a nurse crying. I'm like, nurse crying? Which, you know, you don't see a nurse crying, you know? And so I kind of had this big loop and wire coil thing came down. I turned the volume down. And so I'm listening. And all of a sudden, another one came out of the emergency room. She was crying. So I'm listening. And apparently, there had been a three-year-old girl that had pulled a whole uh, a pot of boiling water on top of her. And it went down inside of her face, down her chest. And so the paramedics went to the house, and they picked her up, and they brought her in, and inside the emergency room, they started taking all, more of her clothes off. What they didn't realize is that all that boiling water went right straight down into her boots, and, and, and her, it didn't let the water out. So, to put it lightly, that little girl lost her feet that day. 
You know, now I remember lying there going, that poor girl. And I remember saying, you know, Pete, you ain't got it so bad. You ain't got it so bad. That was my fifth surgery. I'm on the edge of the bed waiting for breakfast. And uh, in comes a girl. She's 10, 11. Um, she was in a house fire at age three. She was coming in for more surgeries. And uh, she didn't get out of the house. The whole family got out. She didn't. Mother ran, ran back in, pulled her out. She was burned 90% of her body. Yeah, she had no hands. She had no lips, no nose, no ears. The oils around her eyes kept her eyes safe. And she had like a little one-inch spot where her hair didn't burn. And it was sticking up like this, like an antenna. And she had that baby loaded with barrettes. And uh, she came in. And we became good friends, you know. And um, she was upbeat. And I remember it was uh, art day in the playroom. So we went out to art. So I'm learning to draw, you know, with my left hand. I have one right hand. It was pretty easy because I was young. So I'm doing my go-to bird, the, the robin. <laughs> and I'm drawing a robin. And so she's over there, and she's got paintbrush in her teeth. And she's going... And I'm, I got done my robin, and I'm all proud of that robin, you know. It's so like, I grab my robin, <laughs> and I go over to her, and I walk around, and I could not believe it. I mean, your hands couldn't have done any better. It was just sunflower within the lines, perfect color. So I took my robin, folded it, put it behind my back, <laughs> you know. And, and, and I looked at her, and she goes, what do you think? That's amazing, you know. And that's how she was, upbeat, the whole time. You know, so it kind of took my own afflictions off. I started saying, there's always somebody out there worse than you. Always. Excuse me. Well, middle school came, and I wanted to play basketball. So I go to mom and dad. Mom and dad, I want to play basketball. And they said, absolutely. Always encouraged me. Didn't treat me any different, my brothers. I think I got more spankings than they did. And so I, I said, uh, I'm going to go for tryouts. It's, it's next week. Uh, they said, absolutely. So I can only imagine, you know, mom and, mom and dad in bed that night. I can hear my mother going, you know, Roland, I'm not going to make the team. And he's going to have he's going to have this following his whole life. I mean, how is this going to affect him mentally? And, you know, and I can hear my dad going, yeah, I know, Kathy. Think of the gas money we're going to save. <laughs> <clears throat> so, not only did I make the tryouts, but I was starting guard on our team. Not only was I starting guard on our team, but I demolished a points record the second season. Um, our team had 48. I had 45 of them. And um, so... Then we went to the championship. So, five seconds left on the clock. We're down by one, and they follow me, thinking, hey, listen, get the Frost kid. He'll never make the basket, right? You know? So, I go to the line, one and one, five seconds left. I'm sitting there, and I didn't know God, so I couldn't pray. So, I'm like, ah. Oh. Side, dribble, dribble, dribble. Die. Launched it up. Swish. Game's tied. Oh, no. Dribble, dribble, dribble. Die. Launched it up. It's the back of the rim. Goes straight up. Swish. Comes down. So we won the championship, and I was awarded two trophies that year. Uh, breaking a record in high school. I mean, in middle school. And um, the championship. So it felt really neat to do that. It was an accomplishment that felt really neat to do that. Then I got picked for the All-Star team. And uh, I was like seventh or eighth man. So that was, that was an honor, too, that year. So then baseball season came around. And I said, hey, Mom, Dad, I want to play baseball. Absolutely. He said, sure. I said, but I, I want to be a pitcher like my brother Troy. Because Troy was a really good pitcher. And I said, I want to be a pitcher. And I said, okay. I said, you know, I've been throwing a baseball around with my right hand. It feels normal because I was born right-handed and uh 
Okay. I said, I want to be a pitcher. Okay. So I practiced at home, you know, trying to get ready to go out for tryouts. My brother started playing with me, you know. Then I kept bouncing them off their shin and bruising them up, and they chased the ball. So they gave up on me. Then Dad would come home from work. He'd go in. He'd get a he'd get a rug, put it put it in the grass on the lawn. Said, "Okay, kneel down." You know, Dad hung in there for a while until he missed a couple that and hit him right where you're supposed to be wearing a cup. And and then Dad would stand up and say, "Okay, Pete, we're done for the night. Done for the night." So I tried out for the team. Made the team, and I was on the uh, the pitching rotation. I made starting pitcher. Now that means two things: uh, uh, I was that good, or our team was that bad. I'm not going to tell you which one because you're going to find out in a few minutes. So, um, I remember a batter coming up, and he was a uh, like a home run king, and I'm like, I, I want to strike this guy out, make a statement, you know. So I geared up, I step back. I give it everything I had. Boom. Next thing I know, the batter drops down. I hear screaming, hollering, people in the stands potting. And I'm like, well, evidently, <laughs> evidently, the ball exited about there. <laughs> and it went over the backstop, into the crowd, and people in the crowd are potting. So after the dust cleared and the kid's eyeballs got back in his head and he got up off to the ground, he, uh, my coach yells out to the mound. He goes, hey, Frost, what was that? And I went, I had think quick. I went, uh, coach, that was my no pinky ball. So my coach starts laughing. He turns towards the outfield and leans over for the whole inning. He just kept laughing and laughing. <laughs> excuse, excuse me. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> I had two brothers that loved me enough to put the knuckles to me. No, they put the knuckles to me. No, did they do that? They picked me last. Hit ball, kickball, football, basketball, anything with a ball on it, right? Then they'd sneak out to the movies, right? They wouldn't take me. If they did take me, guess where they put me? All the way to their left. Why? Disadvantage. I couldn't grab much popcorn. Oh, yeah. They didn't take it easy on me. Best thing they could have done. I had two loving parents that allowed me to three-wheel, four-wheel, motorcycle. I, I was mowing lawns, paper routes, playing sports. They didn't treat me any different than my brothers. Best thing they could have done. I remember um, in junior high, I always thought scars and acne, they were equal. You know, they were, they were the same thing, right? So I remember going to the pool with my friends, you know, and I wasn't a shy guy, you know. I was like, you know, I am what I am, kind of like a Popeye thing, you know. And so we went to the pool, and my, my buddies took the shirt off, you know. So I'm like, meh. I took my shirt off, you know. I got about four steps. And have you ever seen a cat accidentally wander into a dog show? You know what I mean? And all the dogs just stop doing what they're doing, and they're like looking at the cat like, really? Really? Well, yeah, that's how I felt. So I kind of took four steps back and put on a T-shirt. So I started to wear a T-shirt at the beach or um, at the pool. So one day, I was at the beach, 90 degrees out. Some kid comes up to me. He goes, man, what are you doing wearing a T-shirt? It's 90 degrees out here. You know, they say kids can be cruel. I tried so hard not to be. I tried so hard not to be. So I looked at him. And I said, yeah, I said, have you heard this? Sunburns cause severe scarring. And he looks at me and he goes, huh? And I went, see? And his eyeballs got like this. I think he said something about getting a T-shirt on. I wasn't sure. Well, after 16 operations and 1,000 stitches um, in the eighth grade, I decided to call it quits. Uh, Shriners wanted to do some more surgeries. But I said to myself, you know, Pete, hey, listen, you broke records in basketball. You invented the no pinky ball. You won two sexy leg contests. And you can shave your face and butt at the same time. I said, who needs earlobes? Right? So I never went back. 
Now, during my teen years, I started questioning, like, um, origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Like, where do we humans come from? You know what I mean? And why are we here? What's our purpose? Where do we go when we die? You know, I felt there's, there's something more than just living and dying, and it doesn't make sense to me. Excuse me. So, I had a friend that was um, strong in his faith. And so, I, uh, I've been to church with him off and on when I was younger. But I went just because I had to, because I stayed at his house. So, but now I was serious, so I was like, I got in his car one night, and I started pumping the questions to him. I'm like, you know, I said, why are we here? And he's smiling. He kind of waiting for me to ask that. So he looks at me and he says, do, do you truly want to live the purpose that God made you for? I'm like, you can do that? <laughs> you know? And he just smiled. So he gets into the, he had a Bible in his car. Everybody back then, there was no cell phones. Everybody had a Bible in the car. If, if you went to church, it stayed in your car, you know? And so he started going through the Bible and I'm sitting there and he, and he came across this verse that said, uh, in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so I remember looking at that. I said, so this is Jesus talking to his disciples. His disciples have no idea he's going to go to the cross and die for humanity, for all of sin. Okay? But he's telling them right up front, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I remember looking at this. So he's saying, you go to heaven, but you got to go through him. Okay? Yeah. But what stuck out with me is, says, I am the way. And I'm going, well, I'm looking for the way. Because I, I felt lost. It says, I am the truth. I'm definitely looking for the truth. I haven't met anybody that isn't looking for the truth. I am the life. Hmm. I want to know what life's about. What, what's our purpose? Why are we here? So I looked at him, and I, I, he had me kind of, I was interested on that scripture, but I didn't let him know that. I said, uh, so let's say I don't reply to Jesus' invitation. You know, you say he's always knocking on the door, and da, da, da. Let's say I don't reply, and I live my life the way I want, da, 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 da. What happened? You know, I was kind of putting him on the spot to see if he, you know, um, trying to find a, a hole in his armor. So back then, of course, he's going through the Bible, and I'm sitting in the car. And it took him a while, because, you know, he was 16 years old. So you could almost hear the music playing. Doom, 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 doom. So finally, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, it's right here. Mark 8, 36, 37. Well, what shall it profit the man if he gains the whole world and lose his soul? Well, what can he exchange for his soul? So he's kind of answering my question here, if I didn't. Except, right, what would happen? So I looked at that, so I started asking questions. For what shall it profit the man if he gains the whole world? So even if a person gains the whole world, but loses his soul, there's nothing you can exchange for your soul. I said, so there's nothing you can get up there and you can't say, hey, yo, on earth I had a big truck, small tires. I'll trade, I'll trade it so I can get in. No, you can't do that. You, you, when you're dead, you're facing God, it, it's too late. So that's what the scripture saying. So I kind of looked at him and said, so heaven's not a given. He goes, no, who told you that? I said, I don't know. I'm new to this. <laughs> so I looked at him, and I had a pull. I had a pull in that God-shaped hole that everybody's born with. Fireflies, not butterflies, fireflies. I'm ready to pounce. I says, all right. I said, how do you do this? So that night, I accepted Jesus Christ into my life. I said, Lord, if you're real, forgive me for what I've done. I want to know you. Help me understand your word. If you're not real, then it'll be a fad. You're going to go away. So that started my walk into Christianity. And, excuse me, I probably would have made a better impression on my, my family uh, especially my brother Stu. Um, I had just gotten the Bible. It was two weeks. I was going through it, and Stu's sitting at the at the bar eating breakfast, and I'm sitting on the couch going through the Bible. Right? I didn't know nothing about the Bible, so I go, oh, "Hey, Stu, 
And he goes, what? I go, the Bible tells you how to get a job. And he looks at me and he goes, that's Job, you hammerhead. I went, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I think I'll start here first. So I did. That's where I read, I read that first. You probably shouldn't, but I did. I was interested. You know, after being called a hammerhead, I... <clears throat> Well, in high school, I met a, a young lady named Heidi. Uh, she had an amazing personality. She was very attractive, and she definitely made me look good. She saw a young man that was kind, confident, loving, and could make her laugh. Well, see, that guy didn't work out, so she gave me a chance. Um, after dating a few months, I realized, play it smart. Keep my T-shirt on at the beach with her and never, ever put my right hand on her shoulder during a horror movie. Oh! That, that's, that didn't go well. <laughs> um, well, my psychology seemed to work. I, I, we dated for six years. I got a job directly at a, uh, at a high school work at CML. Um, in 1990, Heidi and I got, uh, got married. Two years later, we, uh, Jade was born. Two years after that, Austin was born. Then uh, all you know, um, life gets extremely busy. As... Uh, as, as you know, time goes by fast, and kids grew up. Soon, uh, Austin and Jade were teenagers, and keeping them focused on school and church and life and everything else was a chore. You know, sometimes I think it's still a chore. But, um, and so I remember a sp specific night. Jade and Austin came in late. I said 10, they, they made it 11. And, and I was always up. Uh, you know, I was the type of parent that would meet him at the door. And well, I uh, met him at the door, gave him my lecture. And then one of them looks at me and says, Dad, just because the Bible says so, it doesn't mean it's true. And then one of them says, Dad, just because you say it's wrong, what makes it wrong? I went, get, get to bed. So I realized when I went to bed that night how empty my worldview was. What was the methodology of my ideology? Why did I think and believe the way that I did? I believed God was real but felt narrow-minded, not knowing a lot about other religions and their beliefs. A few months after that, I began to read and study with an objective lens. So about 15 years ago, I began to scratch the surface of studying evolution, religion, Atheism, contingencies, philosophy, science, the anatomy, ethics, the Bible, the Quran, and anything that would shed light as to why I am a Christian and believe in the Bible. I promised myself to stay correctable by the evidence of truth, fact, and logic. At the time, Jade and Austin had no idea that their dad, that their statements would cause their dad to dig into so many subjects. I set out to answer objectively the harder questions to attest to my beliefs. See, there are four areas that have influenced us since we were created. Philosophical, psychological, social, and religious. But see, you only get truth from philosophical findings. Just because a spiritual leader, parent, scientist, or culture says it's true, does not mean it's true. A thought paired with reality equals truth. Truth is discovered. It's not invented. Truth is transcultural and exists independent of anyone's knowledge. I quickly realized to logically make a statement that there's no designer, no maker, no creator, no information giver, and all we can observe came from a random, mindless, unguided process. And it leaves one scratching their head. Why? With respect and open mind, I read and studied some of the, the leading atheist scientists' claims as to how the universe, Earth, and human life came into existence. Excuse me. As a lover of science, we need to remember that not every statement by a scientist are statements of science. We need to remember that scientists as a human being did not create themselves. In a world, they did not create. Um, studying the cause and effect relationship of everything that was already here before them. 
When a prominent scientist tries to justify their theories, it does not automatically launch it into the truth category. We need to remember, once again, truth is discovered. It's not invented. The truth is, design comes from a designer. Information comes from an information giver. Life comes from a life giver. Cause from a causer. Law from a lawgiver. Creation from a creator. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Every honest scientist will tell you you don't get codes, languages, ethics, love, truth, causality, reason, information, mora morality, evil, or even science itself from a mindless, unguided process. It's impossible. When British mathematician Roger Penrose was asked, Hey, Raj, what's the probability of our universe and all of it coming to existence by chance? He says, well, he goes, it's right around 1 to 10 to the 143rd power. What does that mean? That's a 1 with 1,430 zeros after it. That's more zeros than there are fundamental and elementary particles in our universe. The problem with that is, chances and probabilities, cease a stop right around 1 to 10 to the 50th power. Not even close. So to put it in layman's terms, the chance that we're here by chance would be the same chance that me or you, picking up a slingshot, putting a half-inch rock in the slingshot, aiming at a one-inch target, letting it go and hitting it 20 billion light years away. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You know, Pete, I'm a pretty good shot. <laughs> uh, you're not going to make it. <laughs> so, I know God's a personal God. I know this for a fact. Do you remember when I was five and I was in Shriners in the playroom? And I was asking God, talking to him, just like I'm talking to you today. I remember two years after I became a Christian, everyone goes through their ups and downs, you know? So I was uh, kind of like sad to question, you know, I felt God was distant, like maybe he didn't, you know, answer my prayer, you know, I, you know, I didn't get to go to the movies or something, you know? So I said, God, you know, I don't feel you. You know, are you real? And it went on and on. And I said, hey, listen, I was honest with him. I said, I'm a hard-headed Italian. I said, I need to know if you're real. I'm black and white. I said, I need to know if you're real. So I asked him for weeks and months. And <laughs> I remember I was walking down the street one day. I remember where it was. And all of a sudden, poof, it was like a freight train hitting me. I remember... This voice inside, not no voice said, yo, yo, Pete, yo, yo, it's God, yo. It was inside, and I just, just as plain as day, said, hey, Pete, if I'm not real, uh, who are you talking to in Boston at the age of five when there's no religious influence on you? Mm -hmm. if, uh, if I'm not real, why, are you, why do you need to have to talk to anybody outside of yourself? I went, hmm. If I'm not real, why are you questioning your origin, your meaning, or where you'll spend eternity? Hmm. Pete, if I'm not real, why are you standing in the middle of the road looking up, talking to me? I went, ah, okay, okay. I smiled and I said, okay, God, this hot headed Italian gets it. I get it. Okay. So, um, after lightly studying um, some of the major religions, I respectfully came back to the Bible table with a different view. Uh, now that my eyes are wide open, I lightly scratched some of the major religions, but was blown away at the magnitude of what was in the Bible now that my eyes were wide open. There's no other writing that contains 66 books, 40 different authors, over written over a 1,500-year period. There's no other book that gives you an objective roadmap containing manuscript evidence, archaeological evidence, and prophetic evidence that pricks the heart with relevancy no matter what generation you were born in. The Bible contains army generals, priests, philosophers, shepherds, judges, kings, disciples, letters, poetry, history, and a virgin birth. Jesus came into the world like 
no other. He fulfilled countless prophecies to the letter. Prophecies that were written hundreds of years before he came. He performed miracles and healings that were seen and documented by his followers. Theist, deist, and atheist historians alike wrote about him. He not only claimed to be the Son of God, but backed it up by being crucified, placed in a tomb that was sealed with a massive stone, guarded by the government's biggest and best guards. Three days later, he came back to life and was seen by many before ascending back to the Father. Jesus' tomb remains empty to this day, and his foretellings and promises continue to take place, just as he said they would. Excuse me. Now, if you're going down the road, and there's two people lying in the road, one of them's dead, one of them's alive, who are you going to ask for direction? In closing, excuse me, <clears throat> I remember watching a documentary. Documentary, there's eight ways you can say it and still sound stupid. Um, <clears throat> I just did two. Um, that thing. Uh, so I was watching TV, and um, I was watching, uh, there was an African tribe. There were six of them, and they were going hunting for baboon for meat. And one had a spear. One had a bag, and the other four had nothing. I'm like, hmm. So they go to the edge of a field. It's the size of a football field. And the guy with the bag goes all the way to the other end, and he takes out these seeds with honey on them, and he places them. He starts placing them across the field. And then he goes up to a tree, and there's like a little hole in the tree, and he takes out this little tube, and then he dumps these seeds down inside this too. And then he go back in the woods. And they're all kind of like talking. About 20 minutes later, out of the woods comes this great big baboon. So he starts looking around, putting the seeds to him, you know. So he eats the seeds, keeps looking, eats the seeds, keeps looking, comes across the field. And so they're being very quiet. So he gets up to the tree. And he smells. So then he goes, takes his hand, makes it really narrow. And he goes, uh, 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 and gets in. And when the African could see his muscles tighten, it means he had a handful. He walked, out, the guy with the spear walked outside screaming, yelling at the baboon. Well, the baboon now has a handful. His fist full, he can't get back out. So he's screeching it, and he's hawing at him. Baboon won't let go. He will not let go of those seeds. So he walks up to him, gets within four feet, and the baboon's flipping, showing his teeth, almost pulling his arm out of socket. He goes, Phoom. Tells the baboon right there. What are some of the things that we hang on to that keeps us from the truths of Christianity? As we get closer to the end of our life, what will we, we be found hanging on to God's promises, truth of Christianity, God's promise of heaven, his holy word. Or will we be found hanging on to something of this world that won't even equal a handful of seeds? You know, C.S. Lewis says, you aim for heaven, you get earth thrown in. I like that statement. Think about it. You aim for heaven, Earth is just kind of you're here, but it's not final, and you you got something forever more. So it's like you enjoy it more. You really enjoy life more because this ain't it. But he also says, you aim for Earth, this world, you get neither heaven or Earth. I had a gentleman tell me years ago. He goes, Pete, this this world is like seawater. Everything in it is the more you take in, the thirsty you're gonna get and it will never satisfy you. And if your hope is in this world, well, that's kind of like wearing a hospital gown. And my wife and Carrie can tell you, you're not quite as covered as you think you are. I remember when Jade and Austin were little, they were just toddling. I'd take them up the road, and they would, uh, you know how kids are. 
They pick up things, shiny things. They see something shiny, they pick it up. So I remember one of them, I can't remember which one, picked up like a barrette or a nickel or something that was shiny. And they picked it right up. And they, they think they got something big. It's a treasure. And so they turn around, and they, I'm standing there. And they turn around to me like, I'm going to give treasure to me. And you know, us parents, we become Hollywood actors that, you know, when our kids are little, oh, was that for me? <laughs> you know, and I put out my hand, and they, they put it in my hand, rusty, you know, half rusty barrette. You know, I go, oh, thank you so much. You know, and then they turned around. And I went, yeah, do that thing in the world. Excuse me. I didn't need anything from Austin or Jade. There was nothing I needed from them. What I wanted was them is to have a relationship with me because I was their father. What I wanted from them is them to love me because I was their father. What I wanted them to know is I had their best interest. And if they would listen to my advice, it would keep them away from a lot of life's harm and keep them safer. They live a better life. That's the exact same reason God made us. It's no different. We're made in his image and we're still imaging. We're still doing the same thing. He still wants us to have a relationship with him the same way I want to have a relationship with my kid. I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. <clears throat> I'm going to take this old scratchy voice away. Um, first of all, don't be a baboon. Second of all, don't you ever tell anybody that the Bible tells you how to get a job Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate your time.